All right. Next, I'd like to introduce Andrew Tang. He's the Senior Vice President for Business Development at Greensmith Energy Management Systems, formerly with pg &E. Yes. So, tough act to follow. Let's see, we've had some fantastic presentations um, all morning long and, and, and this afternoon. And um, we had a great lunch, and it's now 2.30, and by now I think the uh, this, the nap time is starting to settle in, so hopefully I will uh, try and keep you guys engaged and, um, and awake. So I'm, I'm uh, Andy Tank, and um, I'm with Greensmith Energy Management. Uh, we take a different approach to some of the people that we've heard so far from today in energy storage, so I'm excited to, uh, to give this presentation. Um, but as Craig mentioned, um, I was formerly with, um, with Pacific Gas and Electric Company, and um, I want to start this off by saying that, you know, the past really is prologue sometimes to the future. Um, Hal LaFlash, John Eric Thom, and, and I used to get together, oh, probably once a quarter, um, and try to talk about, you know, the futuristic trends. And we were, you know, a little bit, a little bit kind of on the renegade side in, in pg and &E. We were trying to see what we saw coming with electric vehicles, what we saw coming with smart metering, um, and what we saw coming with, with energy storage. So this is, um, I borrowed from my past, and this is a presentation that I had given at the um, um, Cal Academy of Sciences on April 23rd, 2009. And we were talking about res uh, renewable resource integration. And so if you see, we've got um, renewable generation on the left-hand side, and we've got kind of a, a drawing of the grid, and, and, and some microgrids or, or, or uh, islanded homes. Um, and what, what I said was that today, all this integration is done with conventional, you know, in, in California natural gas fired resources. But I also made the comment that tomorrow, utility scale distributed storage to back up intermittent resources and to time shift resource availability to be coincident with demand. And also distributed generation and distributed storage to apply similar, similar principles at the customer premise. So, you know, five years in the utility time scale is not bad. <laughs> it really is. So. Anyway, past is prologue. Um, higher level approach. You know, this this is a, a you know our view of the, of the modern grid, or actually this is our view of, of the grid, the, the old fashioned grid. One way directional flows of power from from rural places where you build big generation through transmission, through distribution, eventually to homes, into neighborhoods, into businesses. And what's really happening is with the advent of, of renewables, both wind and solar, with the advent of distributed generation, distributed solar, distributed wind, um, you know, it's really, we're really straining the grid. Right? We've created this distributed network now that, that really strains the grid. And so these challenges, they occur in real time, right? I mean, they occur over the course of a day. They occur, uh, they occur over the course of weeks. This is an actual live shot from our software um, of a solar uh, 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 facility that's in a parking lot in San Diego. San Diego, we think of San Diego as the land of perfect sun, right? But look at this particular week. This is the, you know, Monday through Friday of this particular week. And um, those are not really smooth curves. And, you know, I had to do my obligatory duck curve. And I think everyone has to do the duck curve, right? So, um, you know, these timing issues are going to require, and, and, and the fact that we've got all these renewables coming online, are going to require an entire overhaul of the grid. Just an entire overhaul, a look at how we run this grid. And so, Greensmith, my company, we provide solutions ranging from software, the software analytics layer, to do what people can say they want done, right? To, I mean, it's one thing to supply the battery. It's the, uh, you know, several panelists have made a comment of, well, now, what do you do with those? With those batteries, right? How do you actually perform ancillary services? How do you do um, how do you do time shifting? And how do you do it in a way that that um, optimizes the performance of the battery, optimizes the, the life of the battery, um, and also allows you to meet performance scores such as PJM's performance score for frequency regulation. Um, and then we go all the way down because of the industry being the state that it is. We go all the way down to turnkey solutions too, where we actually containerize the batteries. <laughs> Uh, do all the um, do all the balance of plant work, actually get it to the site, and and, uh, and do the uh, factory acceptance testing, and then turn it over to the to the customer. But where we're really focused on is the software layer, and um, you know we, there's a wide array of challenges which we all know about, right? Whether it be ramp rate control, this especially becomes prevalent in microgrid type situations, especially a lot of situations in the islands, you know, the true microgrid. Frequency regulation. 
Uh, we have a project going on right now being deployed that will be that will go live by December of this year. That is a, uh, a large 20 megawatt, 9 megawatt hour frequency regulation project being bid into PJM. And the focus that the team has been focused on is developing that software to make sure that we have a 95 or better performance score of that project. Renewable smoothing, which ramp rate control renewable smoothing, you kind of that one one flows into the other. Um, and finally, capacity shift. Another aspect that I think is going to be very important in the coming months, I think people are, are looking at storage right now as point solutions. But as you think about, you know, maybe where this becomes first most obvious is in behind the meter applications. And then again, this becomes very, uh, this will start, to, will start to emerge as an issue in larger grid scale deployments as well. But it's the ability to basically create teams. If you envision a utility or an IPP or some other you know, market participant, if you envision them owning essentially a fleet of batteries, and the fleet of batteries may be, may be you know, geographically located, geographically dispersed, but geographically dispersed behind different distribution pressure points for a utility, for instance. And you can see the value how on you know, one day you might be focused on, it might be 110 degrees in, in, you know, across Northern California, or across California, um, you know, that grid, our, our grid might be at the 56, 57 gigawatt peak load. Um, you know, we're well into our resource adequacy um, and, you know, demand response is being called. You may see the need for all of your storage assets across the state to be called in to do, to do capacity shifting. So you aggregate them all, you team them up, and you do capacity shifting. And then the next day the weather breaks, right? And so suddenly you don't, you know, you, you don't have the demand response value. Um, there, there's adequate resources on the grid. However, you still have all these resources, and maybe you, broke, you break up that team, which is what this uh, drawing on the right is trying to show. Maybe the blue storage resources are used for, for capacity. Maybe the, the red ones are used for frequency regulation, and the, uh, the green ones are used for, for uh, you know, to take excess output off of solar. Right. So this dynamic grouping is, 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 uh, is a key capability that we think is going to emerge in the marketplace as a very important um, differentiator. And so, a lot of great presentations on batteries. Um, we take a little bit of a different approach. We're focused on energy computing. We, um, we are battery and, and inverter agnostic. So we are looking at, a, at creating a platform that can use anyone's battery and anyone's inverter. Because we feel that as the market evolves and as the market grows, it's going to be a situation where an IPP or a utility is not going to want to have that vendor lock into a particular technology. Right? And we should play the fact that there are multiple technologies, there are multiple technology curves that we're able to, uh, to benefit from. So we have, um, we have integrations with um, eight battery companies, eight different battery vendors. Um, that number is actually growing to 12 by the end of this year based on, on, on backlog projects that we have. Um, and six PCS vendors. So we feel this is important. The second thing that we feel is important is this network distributed control architecture that we talked about on the previous slide. Um, and then the third layer area is you know, software and data analytics, having that framework to really do, do more with this data. Um, as I mentioned, um, we have grown from, from demonstration projects, at kilowatt, kilowatt and kilowatt hour scale projects, to megawatt and megawatt hour scale projects. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the work we got. I mentioned um, earlier that we had a, uh, we had a uh, project uh, that we we're uh, deploying this year. Um, 20 megawatts, 9 megawatt hours, uh, frequency regulation. Basically, that you know that set of batteries is going to be performing practically 24/7 to perform uh, frequency regulation, fitting, fitting those services into the um, In addition, we um, we are partner, and our, our business model is very flexible. So we like to work together with either utilities or developers or agencies, depending on, on the nature of the um, we are uh, uh, partnered with several people in looking at the Southern California Edison um, um, RFO, and again, looking at um, how you you know how you support something on the order of, of four hours of, of capacity at a very very high conversion um, high rate. Um, talk a little bit about the behind the market, the behind the meter opportunities. Um, you know, obviously, some of the, the drivers here would be utility tariff trends, demand charges continue to increase. Um, in California alone, demand charges have increased about 21 percent over the last um, over the last uh, four years. Um, 
solar developer market expansion. You see what um, we had that great presentation from JD, his sister company at Solar City. Um, you see what, what Tesla and Solar City are doing together. Uh, third party finance models continue to emerge. Right? We have the, uh, the Wall Street financiers getting eager to try and try and see if they can deploy, uh, deploy capital with very attractive um, guaranteed rates of return. Um, you know, the storage enabler of, of grid edge dynamics, the whole DG EV. Um, tier clipping of, of, of utilities' most uh, uh, most profitable customers, you know, really is or, or you know will lead to a death spiral unless they, they start to mobilize. And then, of course, the most important thing is regulatory support. Um, you know, whether it be FERC, AB 2514, um, the actual RFOs that are coming out, um, the S chip program, there is a groundswell of support. Right? This is this industry is ours to now make into a major industry because the regulatory support is there. Um, and then I wanted to close just talking about one, um, one, uh, in a great, one, one project we've got in Southern California. This is, I, I thought it was some small, small pictures, but this is a, a carport. We've got a solar canopy over a, uh, over a parking lot for, a, uh, for an office building, a commercial office building in San Diego. And uh, the chart on the uh, left-hand side shows the PV generation on a particularly cloudy day. The chart on the right-hand side shows the EV charging load, so you see it's below the line, it's below, uh, low for that typical day. And then the bottom chart actually shows the smoothed output, or the, or the, the combined output and the, the smoothing using the battery, so using uh, the uh, the battery energy storage system. And so the issue here, the problem was, was that this, this company had level one and level two chargers totaling about 30 kW. Uh, they had a 25 kW solar shade counter. <coughs> Um, obviously, you know, with this kind of uh, a chart, there were you know rapid ramp up and ramp down issues due to due to, uh, due to weather, um, and uh, and you know the sudden low jump due to due to um, uh, the, uh, EV charging. So we deployed a 50 kW, 88 kWh energy storage system in this place, and we're doing a load management and power ramp control rate operations. And uh, that's my presentation. Any questions? Thank you. One thing I haven't heard yet uh, in all the acronyms is uh, NERC compliance. And uh, it seems like maybe Greensmith might be uh, a place that could take a look at that from the cybersecurity standpoint uh, and, and other issues having to do with uh, re reliability and stability. Yeah, um, you know, obviously with our, with our asset that is going, um, uh, going live, for, for air compliance, air compliance is a, is a very important issue. We have, um, I, I was formerly at a demand response company, it was a, a cloud-based company. The um, NERC issues were significantly harder because we were trying to move the industry towards a cloud-based architecture. Right now we are a behind the firewall deployed um, um, application. And so our issues become significantly less challenging because we're, you know, we're, we're, we're leveraging behind our partners' firewall and our partners their compliance essentially behind their firewall. But you're right. I mean, as we evolve and as you think about, about other um, architectures and moving towards more of a cloud-based system, you know, NERC SIP compliance is a big, big, big issue in this industry. Andy, over here. Um, given your past experience with PG&E and, and being a, uh, a core insider with, with Hal LaFlash and John Eric Thalman, I would think you're in a really good position to uh, help move the, the policy and, and market structures in, in the direction that they need to go to really monetize these kind of opportunities that you're working on. Um, does your organization you know, have some thoughts on that? Are you personally involved in that process of, and you're working in PJM obviously, so uh, even just bringing some of those great market structures there and helping them land in California and elsewhere would be really useful. You know, I think one of the most important things that we've got to get right is the interconnect, right? And the interconnect proceeding um, that's going on with the CPUC, I mean, for those of you that have a vested interest in this, in this industry, I think we all, we, we all owe it to ourselves to make sure that we're paying attention to that, we're participating in that proceeding. Um, you know, we're working, on, uh, we're working on some projects down in Southern California Edison right now, and, you know, this whole interconnect process, I mean, we, we had this, this emergency deadline that we had to meet 
We had to file some engineering studies to understand what the grid impacts would be on these systems. We had to file them by late April, right, late last month. And this is for projects that, that can't go live. I mean, that, that process is the cue. That is what causes, causes the, the lead time, right? Those projects won't go live until 2016, 2017. They'll get delivered in 2016. But they can't turn on until 2017. So that's the challenge for it. We, we've got to smooth out this interconnect process. Is there any more questions? Yeah, your, your last slide there, uh, I assume that was a grid connected system, but given how it's actually behind, that's actually behind the meter. Okay. Um, Does it have to be connected to the grid at all? I mean, could it be completely free of the grid given how the, the line looks at the bottom? <laughs> that was a, uh, this one was, uh, this one, we did go through the process to get this pretty fast. Well, it gets back to whether or not the intent is to export that to the grid. Okay. Well, thank you very much.